no, this is not some fantasy land, some amusement park full of virtual thrills. This is not a field of dreams, although dreams were its genesis. This startling place is about what was, what is, and what might be. It is a temple, a shrine to the glory of science and to the eye-popping, jaw-dropping wonder of truth. Welcome to the broadcast. Tonight we get lost in the stars at New York City's New Hayden Planetarium, part of the American Museum of Natural History's new Rose Center for Earth and Space. From New York, a special edition of Charlie Rose. Three years and $210 million later, the wish has come true. The vision has become reality. With support from public sources such as NASA and private support from friends of the museum, the old and much beloved Hayden Planetarium has been reborn as an 87-foot sphere seemingly floating inside a 95-foot tall glass cube. And there is the dramatic spiraling walkway as long as a football field called the Cosmic Pathway. It traces 13 billion years of cosmic evolution, bracketed by dramatic space photos and interactive displays. It is on the pathway that we join the museum's president, Ellen Futter. I mean, this is the closest I'll ever get unless I get lucky and get to go into space. I mean, when you look here and you look up, I mean, what am I seeing here? Well, that's Jupiter, and of course, right above you is Saturn with its fantastic rings. Uh, but this may not be the closest you get, because even beyond this, we'll take you into the space theater, yeah. and then you'll feel like you're traveling through outer space. Uh, and here, you're right at the beginning of the story. We've just been hatched out of the Big Bang Theater, and now we're going to travel through on this cosmic pathway 13 billion years of the formation of the universe. Now, between the time we take our first step here and walk down this whole long circular right. walkway, 13, 13 billion, billion years, years right. beginning with a billion year journey through cosmic history from That's right. the Big Bang. This is the Big Bang Right theater. behind us. What you don't realize is that you're in the sphere. Well, and the joy of getting inside of an icon. Here we are in a museum known for its icons, T-Rex, the great blue whale, and usually you look up at them and you observe them. But with this icon, we invite you in, and that's spectacular. We invite you into the bottom for the Big Bang, and in the top hemisphere, the upper hemisphere, is the space theater. And there we take you through space. Now, as we look at each one of these, right. you know, as we walk through this process, yeah. what do we, for example, glimpses through time? Well, each one of you, each one will tell you about a major epic. But I think one of the really fun things about this that, that I get asked an awful lot is, well, what happens? Everything's a theory. The Big Bang is a theory. Yeah. Scientists are very con have a lot of conviction about it, but it's a theory. And even the notion that it's 13 billion years is a theory. Yeah. So what happens if you change your mind? Right. Our new discoveries make you, yeah. The, or what happens if there's a new discovery? Right. So this entire facility has been constructed in a way that we can update it. In fact, all of these are sort of screwed in, and we can slide it like a ruler or a slide rule yeah. to bring it up to date. And if the, if the particular uh, episodes change that we want to highlight, although this is an unlikely one, quasars, yeah. that would change, you could change it. It's just label copy. And there's really a lot of fun in that. Here we have uh, wonderful uses of bringing in new information right on the screens as it mm -hmm. happens, possibly even images from outer space as they occur. So we're constantly updating it, constantly infusing it with new images. And it gets really fun when you get down to the bottom because one of the things that this is all about, one of the big ideas that it's all about, is time. The hard things to think about with the universe are time and scale. And the notion that we can take, if you just walk this, even if you don't track every one of these, and it's a lot to track, in fact, yeah. uh, we tend to give a lot of information, this is a high protein journey, uh, even if you don't track every aspect of it, 
just this walk gives you a sense, particularly as we move towards the bottom, and yeah. you see how late in the game the dinosaurs, the age of the dinosaurs is, yeah. and we all think of that as a long, long time ago. And wait till we get to the bottom and you see how, hum how all of human history is represented. Yeah, I have a feeling when we get to the end, I'm gonna realize how we are just a tiny, tiny, tiny speck. Well, you're, you're on to it. <laughs> in, the, in billions of years of history and an entire universe. Well, you, you've now gotten the big idea of time. And now, was this new for you, this whole sense of, of, of the world of the planetarium and the world of, of opportunity to understand the stars? Absolutely. Um, uh, first of all, I'm not an astrophysicist, <laughs> yeah, as you well know. Um, but having said that, you know, I arrived just after the museum had been evaluating the old Hayden Planetarium, yeah. which was something we all loved, many of us grew up sure. with. Um, and at that time, we thought we were just going to update some exhibitions, mm -hmm. uh, update the technology, and that would be that. Uh, and we started to talk to some exhibition designers, and one of them brought in Jim Polshek, yes. uh, the architect. And Jim, and, who, and he and I had worked together before, and Jim took me aside one day and he said, you know, Ellen, I don't think that's going to be enough. I really think that the facility is not going to be able to accommodate what you need in terms of exhibitry and technology to tell the modern story of astronomy and astrophysics. And so we really tried not to do that, though. We said, well, Jim, it's just going to be exhibitory. It's just going to be technology. <laughs> don't, don't get carried don't away, Don't get Jim. carried away here. And he's, a, he's wonderful at getting carried away. And then, of course, the more we looked at it, the more it became clear that Jim was carried away for good reason. And then we thought, we, well, we still wouldn't take the old one down. It had such affection from all of us. Yeah. Uh, but it became a mandate, almost, uh, really, by the fact that it was scientifically and functionally obsolete. And our true mission is to bring the public the latest in our understanding of what the world around us, the universe, is all about. So we end up with the greatest planetarium in, in the, the world. world. Right. The most scientifically advanced and powerful in the world. There is a story <laughs> I want you to confirm for me, which is every architect's and every designer's and every builder's dream. Right. Someone said, suppose money wasn't an object. Right. Think large, what would you do? I assume this may be close to the answer. Uh, I think this was Jim's answer to that question, and that question got asked not quite that way in this process. We made an initial presentation, Jim made an initial yeah. presentation, to our wonderful trustee committee on the planetarium. And one of our trustees said, I think this is great. And looking right at Jim and right at me, <laughs> said, but if money were no object, what would you do? Which is not to say that that is what we'll do, yeah. but let us see the big idea. And of course, that's when Jim really started to let his mind go and came to visit me one day and said, I just want to show you something. And he, we were having a cup of coffee and he took the napkin uh, that I'd given him with the coffee yeah. and he said, you see the half sphere yeah. that was the old Hayden? Suppose I complete it. Right. And suppose then we just put it in a box and we let that be visible. And it was just I immediately knew that the purity of the form that just was so elegant and so right, and most of our most enduring uh, architecture has that kind of elemental, elegant purity of form, classic, bold in its simplicity. And in fact, the sphere is the dominant shape in the universe, so it was the ideal symbol and the ideal icon but for this But was facility. there anything restraining you? Did it, I mean, here you were presented with something that is so simple and so brilliant and so right and right. so breathtaking in terms of what can be. Did you immediately say, we can do this, this no, is I, possible? No, I immediately said, this is magnificent. And then I began to think through the fact that it would cause us to have to take the old one down. By then it was becoming more apparent that that might be required. And of course, I knew what it meant to build something like this in New York. Uh, it's not straightforward, as you know. No. Um, and I knew it was a major undertaking and much more in terms of uh, financial commitment than the museum had previously Now, was there resistance to, to taking down the old? Well, I think there were Landmark, some. Landmark, wasn't uh, it? Landmarks was wonderful. It was, a, it was unanimously approved by Landmarks. It mm. was unanimously approved by the community board. And it got support from the Municipal Arts Society and many other organizations, uh, enthusiastic support, which doesn't always happen. And I think that also speaks to the quality of the design. They, too, looked at it and said, this is right, 
and this is right for a planetarium functioning at the cutting edge of learning. And here we are, Charlie, yeah. right at the age of the yes. dinosaurs. Something and think that I, how this far is what, when I come. think of your museum, this is what I think well, of. Well, this is a good thing to think of, but not, not, not the only thing mm, yeah. to think of, but nice to incorporate in the story of the cosmos yeah. to show where the dinosaurs fit. And then if we continue from this period, just moving down, and look how let close me read, it let is. Let me read this. Beginning of about 24, 240 million years ago, dinosaurs roam our, 240 million years ago, dinosaurs roam our planet. The devastating impact of an asteroid or a comet 65 million years ago coincides with their extinction. Wow. Although, you know, at this museum, we don't think they went as extinct. They evolved into birds. So no, we have yes, a whole exhibit upstairs about that. But then we go all the way down, and look how close these dinosaurs are to where I'm going to take you, yeah. which is right here. And you can hardly see, but this is a human hair. Yes. And all of human history is represented in the width of that hair, which might make you feel just a little inconsequential. It does, <laughs> a little insignificant. But explain to me, I mean, it, 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 help me understand how so people outside can see that and relate to it. I mean, all of human history is a hair, meaning what's the this width, and what's me, this? Meaning the width. Is it's just that the... The human how, history, the width of that compared to that white... No. It, just the width, that, that narrow, narrowest band represented in that very thin object of a human hair. You pulled a hair out of your head and you looked at it, the width of it would represent human history on this pathway. And that's meant to say we are tiny in the yeah. scheme of things. But even those dinosaurs are pretty tiny. Uh, and so this is a great visual way to teach about time and relationships of humanity to the larger cosmos, of humanity to the dinosaurs, etc. And the sense of where we've been and where we may be going. Exactly. Yeah. And where we fit. You walk outside, there's a sphere. Right. And it looks like it's in a box. Right. What's that about? Well, there are two things. One, we had to enclose the sphere, but the other, this is the clearest glass made. And we wanted the sphere to be safe and protected, but transparent from the outside. And we had two purposes. One, we think it's beautiful. Yeah. But second, it was our way of signaling that we were going to de-brick the science as part of making it accessible, comprehensible, ah. not too hard, but for everyone. That you could see it with crystal clear clarity from out there and certainly from in here. And that's our mission, to share understanding of the cosmos with the public. Congratulations. Thank you. We venture into the new Gottesman Hall of the planet Earth, which uses specimens and state-of-the-art displays to explain how the Earth evolved, how it functions, and what may be in store for its future. This is the closest I've ever sent, sensed to being on a spaceship. Well, that's, that's the notion. That is the notion. Uh, and if you look across, there's something called an Earth event wall. And that Earth event wall will show you at given moments all of the activity underneath the Earth's surface across our globe, which is pretty phenomenal when you see there's an earthquake in uh, Japan or yeah. there's a tornado it wherever. It says earthquake rattles California. That's right, that's right. And then, we'll, then we go in depth into various ones. And if something happens, we have it on the screen within 24 hours. We're putting in live feed together with, and that's the joy of an institution that has over 200 working scientists, we'll not only have the sequence up there, mm. but the scientific explanation. So the public will run to this kind of thing to say, what's happening, what did it mean? And you mentioned touching things just while we're in here. This yeah. hall is filled with rocks oh, wow. that we want the public to touch. And they're, they're absolutely spectacularly that's, that's beautiful. A, that's such a, a great thing to have a museum that wants you to touch that's things. Because right. generally you walk in and you know, there's always guards standing there saying, you know, don't touch, don't touch, as it should be with paintings, but be able to look at this and say, That's wow. Right. And yet, I think this is actually a work of art. It's just a natural work of art. Yeah. Quite spectacular and nothing really much more beautiful in the whole wide world. Uh, and you can, if you just peek around here, you get a sense, really, of the Earth as a living force and of your being taken on a journey to the center of the Earth. It's, it's almost yeah. Jules Verne's-like. Uh, Pretty wonderful. What are you going to do? All of a sudden, when this thing opens and the, the, all of the immense publicity will come here right. uh, because of what this is, you know, you're going to have spectacular crowds. It's going to be the most so. visited place in New York, probably, in a very, 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 very quickly. 
Can you handle this? We have been preparing for years. I mean, while some people have been out there with their hammer and, and nails getting it built, a lot of us have been thinking about visitor services. And when I was describing everything that's included, you heard a parking garage, new dining facilities. Uh, all of the visitor amenities have been completely rethought, and not just in the Rose Center, in the whole museum. And we've added an awful lot of staff to help visitors move around, to address questions, explainers who will tell them what's going on all over the museum. This is really is the closest you can come. I mean, there are other places and other museums and other planetariums, clearly. But this is the closest you can come to fully understanding this universe we inhabit. And where we fit, which I think is the question we all want most to answer. What is humanity's place and what does it mean? And some people have gotten to the end of that pathway and said, gee, but we're so small, it's almost depressing. And then they say, well, maybe it really isn't. Maybe it just puts our lives in perspective. And also, I think our scientists would rapidly point out, for however small we may be, we're the ones who figure all this out. And that's really a great achievement, and we're still figuring. We're still thinking about it. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We're going to take a break now. We'll be right back, and we will see more of this magnificent um, Rose Center. Back in a moment. In case you are just joining us, we are at the Rose Center for Earth and Space at the American Museum of Natural History. We have had an opportunity to take a look at this remarkable place, this planetarium, but much, much, much more. An opportunity for people to come here and take a look at the universe and what inhabits this universe. It is uh, from young people to old people. A joy to understand this planet and this universe. Joining me now, Ellen Futter continues. She's the president of the American Museum of Natural History. James Stewart Polshek. Jim Polshek is the architect. Neil deGrasse Tyson is the astrophysicist who will be the director here. And Paul Goldberger, the architecture critic for uh, the New Yorker magazine, who has written about this. And we want now to have a conversation about what this is about. And I'd like to begin that since I've been talking with Ellen to go to Neil, who will continue here after the architect and the critic and the uh, television journalist leaves, will be part of the living, breathing sense of this. Not to say that you want, Jim. I know you'll be coming back a lot. Uh, what does this mean? Tell me what is so big deal about this replacement, this new planetarium. One of our biggest challenges in this subject of astrophysics is when you stop and realize that not many years ago, 70, 80 years ago, this book from my collection of old astronomy right, books right. represented the, an entire college curriculum in astronomy. And you look through the chapters, there's a whole chapter on the Earth, a whole chapter on the Moon, a whole chapter on eclipses and the motion of planets against the background stars. And before you know it, the content is over and done with. And you look at that and you realize Whatever was designed to convey astronomy back in the era of this book would be completely missing whole branches of study that have come upon us since those times. The Big Bang, the search for life in the universe, quasars, black holes, the list is endless. And in the companion volume to the Rose Center, the opening of the Rose Center, this entire, the entire contents of this book took us 10 or 15 pages to cover mm -hmm. in this and all the rest of this volume is the rest of the frontier that's taking us into the next millennium. And the challenge was to design and create a facility that's infused and in a way empowered by the scientific discovery, cosmic discovery, discovery of things, objects and phenomena in the universe that instill in the visitor a sense of awe and wonder. And it's that wonderment that can take a child who might not have ever thought about becoming a scientist and turn them into a scientist that hour, the hour in which they're exposed to this, this grandeur and the, and, and, and the, and the, and the layout, the, the juxtaposition of ideas. This is not a facility where you go and learn about just objects. We, we could have designed it that way. We could have been, well, here's where you learn about Mars and about Jupiter. But we wanted to get to a deeper scientific level than that, where there are phenomena in the universe that reveal themselves on various planets. Storms are on Earth and on Mars. Rings show up on Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The greenhouse effect 
is not just in our own newspapers. If Venus had newspapers, it would be a daily news item there as well. And by finding the, the underbelly of the science that creates the, the connective tissue that enables us to understand how these objects work in this universe, that is the principle around which all of this has come upon us. Jim, put this in context for me for what you do and what the challenge was here and what the mission was that is soon to be uh, mission accomplished. Well, I, I, we've talked about this a lot uh, after the fact and a lot before the fact. I, people often ask, how did, let's say, there were f f four entities in a way. Uh, the science, the interpretation of that through exhibits, the architecture, and obviously, most importantly, the representation of the institution. We were four planets in different orbits, different trajectories, right? Occasionally colliding gently. But as time went on, those orbits became congruent. And there were four of these planets, four of these spheres. Resonant orbits. <laughs> Resonant. <laughs> uh, you're the king of language. But eventually, they came together into one. We brought different things to it. As an architect, in a way, I've never s used this phrase before, but we're kind of merchants of memory, making things memorable. Anticipate, experience, and remember. And our job was, in fact, to try to create a spatial experience that would do that, that would bring people back, that would also create awe and wonder, but awe and wonder in support of the material that Neil has just talked about. So they, they, if we're successful, and when millions of people go through this starting on the 19th of February, uh, the test then will be, do they see it as one totality? as opposed to something that is only in the service of the astronomer, the architect, the exhibit designer, or the institution. What's the driving vision you had? I thought of the whole institution, the whole American Museum of Natural History, and of the conversations that Ellen Futter and I had about it and, and its future, about the concerns of many people, Fred Rose in particular, and his view of this, this unhealed north side of the museum, the many needs the museum had. And I think that ultimately an architecture is memorable if it is, in a sense, a healing art as well as a building art. And so we put on the table a set of fungible ideas but with one overriding uh, direction, which was that this was to be the Rose Center for Earth and Space. It had to be symbolized in a public way. It had to represent the, the visual and the intellectual accessibility of this place, and in an order that the scientists uh, felt comfortable with. Uh, I, I couldn't articulate this at the beginning. I mean, you know, there's always the famous napkin. Paul, yeah, I know Paul's, Paul's written, written. I know about, about that because of Paul. But, <laughs> uh, but but what was the famous napkin thing? Because Ellen has referred to it too. Uh, what did you do? It was um, a dual notation. Uh, one was a simple rectangle with a half a sphere popping out the top. That was the old planetarium, much I beloved. Kind of, uh, classical the old, planetarium. The old, the old right. Hayden planetarium, yeah. 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 a box with a half yeah. sphere, yeah. a dome right, on right, top. Right. But then when I took pen and I went dit, 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 and made that half a sphere a whole sphere, yeah. right? Uh, the proverbial light bulb went off and then we began to test this proposition. And I've said this before that in 1935, is it 1935 yes. when um, I would lie on my back in Akron, Ohio as a, as a very young child and look up at stars. You could see stars in Akron, <laughs> Ohio. Um, that was about looking up and it was about Buck Rogers and comic books and science fiction. Uh, today, you don't look up, you go up. It's Hubble. Mm. It's serious science. And a hemisphere just wouldn't cut it. It seemed to me that the full sphere had the opportunity to present to people. And you just don't go story. up. 
you go down, you go sideways, exactly. you go all around. I think one of the great things that Jim really understood from the beginning was that great architecture was one component, but that this was architecture with a purpose. This was architecture in the service of science, architecture in the service of education, and that gave a synergy to this project, the science and the educational aspects, working with that architecture, reinforced by the architecture, I think ultimately elevated by the architecture, and I think you feel that when you're in here. This sense of space mm. reinforces the sense of vastness of the universe. When you come around that pathway, it reinforces the form of the sphere and its simplicity. So everything Jim did reinforced what Neil and his colleagues were trying to do. That, that's a triumph, and it doesn't always happen, though Paul would know I better. Think it's very important. <coughs> you could put these exhibits in an airplane hangar if you wanted. Yeah. I mean, Ellen could have hired Jim to build a big box. Right. I don't think Jim would have really wanted to build a big box, but <laughs> had he been told to, perhaps he would have. And you could have put most of the exhibits here inside of a box. You could have built a half dome inside of a solid box and had the sky show there and so forth. The question is, what kind of meaning would it have had? And here, the extraordinary thing is the synthesis between real architectural experience, the beauty of that abstract object, the primal shape of all shapes in a way, the sphere. Indeed, yeah. It symbolizes space, it symbolizes infinity in a way that other kinds of orthogonal shapes don't seem to do. It connects us to very basic primal feelings the way pyramids do and things like that within this beautiful glass box. And all of those, those abstractions as a place for housing the ultimate abstraction, which is the universe. Then, There's an extraordinary, extraordinary kind of synergy, really. Two things, then, for you. Uh, one who brings an informed eye to this, both architecturally and, mm -hmm. and, and otherwise. Listening to the mission they were on, did they accomplish the mission, from your perspective? I think they did accomplish the mission. And indeed, as, as everyone said, it was a, a multifaceted mission. Uh, the scientific mission, of course, is part of it, and as I said, that could have been accomplished inside a, an airplane hangar, but it wouldn't have been as, as exciting. It, would have, it wouldn't have communicated itself, I think, as powerfully. And I would say that it wouldn't have, have been accomplished. Or then maybe okay, it wouldn't right. have been accomplished. Fine, fair <laughs> enough. Because it doesn't um, communicate as powerful. Yeah, part, yeah. I mean, part of it the, is be powerful. Right, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And a sense of authenticity, which is something Ellen has said time and Why? time again. I don't understand authenticity. Because we live in an age in which Computer games, virtual oh. reality, theme parks, all kinds of things have taken away some of the thrill that used to be there for kids and adults when they went to museums. Museums have to do two things today, I think. They have to equal and in some cases surpass the thrill that other kinds of mm. uh, entertainment and learning now offer. The, thrill of the, the cheap thrill of the theme yeah. park. At the same time, the genuine, much deeper, much more resonant power of learning about real things with the voice of authenticity mm -hmm. that you don't get at a theme park. That's really the essence of this institution. I mean, we, here we house a collection of 32 million specimens and cultural artifacts, and our stock and trade is the power of reality. And in fact, the only thing more exciting than make-believe is reality. Um, the super stories that we're able to tell and how we inform them through the work ongoing, updated, of our more than 200 scientists like Neil. And that's really what distinguishes this institution. And there is nothing more exciting. And you use the word power. The other thing about the universe is a sense of awe. When you come into Jim's building, it is awesome, as the kids would say, and that's on two of, levels: awesome in terms of what you see, and awesome in terms of the context of where you see it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, this building. Uh, let me take a take an interesting uh, counterpoint uh, to to what was just noted. If this building did not house the universe, you can't imagine what else it could be for. The harmony of the design with the content. I think is, has reached a, 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 a pinnacle where one without the other would just be, would, would lose its power. The container is a metaphor for what it contains. And it's very rare that architecture manages actually to do that. It's a wonderful moment. So, what is the container? The container the is, container meaning is the, the, the whole building. Okay. All the architecture is uh, the container. What's the core of it for you, this place? The center, the, the ultimate experience? 
there's something incredibly optimistic about this. In, at, at a time when, you know, there's a lot of naysaying and we're all too smart and we're all so well educated and we've been on an economic roll for a decade, uh, which of course contributed in many ways to, to being able to achieve this, but it wasn't just that. It's optimistic in, its, in, in the leap it's taken. How optimistic? In, I'm optimistic in, in a sense that it shows that... In, in its belief, in its belief that very young people and older people will come here again to be socialized, to see one another, to learn from one another. That's an optimistic thing to do in the age of the internet, in the age of distance learning. It's optimistic for my profession and my most respected colleagues in that it provided the opportunity to, I hope one will judge in the end, Paul was very kind in judging it, artfully artfully demonstrate that technology can be used in the service of larger ideas, not in the service of a single personality. Just that, for point of reference and context, what do you compare this with? I've compared it to a number of things. Probably the most uh, accessible comparison right now is the Pyramid at the Louvre. I.M. Pei's glass pyramid that's an entrance to the Louvre. And that there you see a, a beautiful, elegant, simple, primal piece of geometry done with beautiful craftsmanship and becoming a symbol of its institution, as I think this will be. One key difference, however, is that's nothing but a front door, a very grand entrance right. into the loop. This, in fact, connects on the deep level we've been talking about to the nature of the exhibits, to the idea of the institution. The pyramid at the Louvre is really a, an empty symbol, as it were, although it's a successful one, I think. This is not an empty symbol. This is a symbol that is simply overflowing with connections to the ideas of the institution. But there is one other, as a planning aspect of that, that <clears throat> the Louvre announced the health of a very old institution as it was going to enter the next century. The Rose Center for Earth and Space does very much that for this institution. It's here, it's healthy, it's alive. The Louvre was marvelous for Paris. This place is going to be spectacular for New York City but also because the images, I believe, will be so memorable, it will be appreciated by people throughout the world. Well, there's also another dimension. It's also a museum for, of the 21st century in the sense that everything that's here, and if you look it's behind us, straight ahead for you, Charlie, to the yeah. Astro Bulletin, oh, look at it's what's happening Breaking news there. in astronomy, it mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. spacecraft finds evidence of liquid ocean below surface of Jupiter's moon. When I tell you that that's going to be fed with live images from Hubble and other resources, that's exciting. That infuses the hall. But when we go another step and say that everything on that bulletin is going to be on the museum's website and that we're going to take it not only and make it available within our walls, but take it outside of our walls into classrooms, homes, community centers across this nation, that takes the, way, the role of a museum to a whole new dimension, and that is going to happen. Yeah, well, what, the I, new dimension, what is that? There's a learning, and it's a, a it sense has a of distance. learning, or the sense of learning that is reaching out far beyond the boundaries of its own sphere. The power of the museum's exactly. educational impact is on-site and also beyond our walls. I, I think one of the great things about the physical building is as the website and this technological communication make it possible to replicate so much of what goes on in here, the power of this space and this object reminds you that there's still a reason to come here yes, also. That's that there's still one thing that you ain't going to get at home. You've got to come here to experience yeah. the reality of this very, very powerful space. But I also wanted to say that I think great institutions like cities have to change to live. They, if, if, they, if they're too static, they die. And I think So that's true of the American Museum of Natural I History, think it, that it had I, to change I think or it die? had to change to keep alive. And in, just as, in fact, the dinosaur exhibitions well, did you recognize changed that when and you reworked themselves. here in themselves. 1993 well, that you had to change this institution and someone said the Hayden Planetarium doesn't? Valuation of the Hayden actually had just begun. What would happen to it had not been decided at all. We were in the process of redoing and updating the dinosaur exhibits. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the museum was on that trajectory. I think with this... But the idea was to, was in a sense, to, to remodel it not Absolutely. to start over. Absolutely, but once we began to really get into it and hear the great ideas of these two fellows and, and Ralph Applebaum who did the exhibitory design and others, uh, it became apparent that this place was its rocket ship to the next century. And by the way, there's important oh, elements here. The, 
the, rocket ship to the next century. Uh, <laughs> <Wait, laughs> uh, before you go to this sure. point, Neil, I mean, it, it's a little bit timely here that we do this at the beginning of the millennium, isn't it? Well, that, that dawned on us. I mean, we, we, <laughs> sure did, we, did, did. we did notice. No, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, Public I, relations I, genius <laughs> here. All right. There's an important dimension to this. It, it wasn't simply that things needed to change to stay current. It was for the dinosaur halls. There was a whole new level of scholarship that informed how the dinosaurs would be presented to the public. Right. How are you mounting T-Rex? Is he standing up like this, holding himself up with his tail, or is he bent over, tail pointed, ready for his next attack? And in the same way here, well, those are bones and you could sort of rearrange them. Here, our artifacts are limited to a 15-ton meteorite, a big artifact at that, but still, our data, our collections are the images and objects of the universe. And that, that is our collection. And the frontier of that collection is, the boundary between what is known and unknown is coming in daily from orbiting telescopes, from space probes to the distant planets. And the way that funnels into this hall is through media such as this bulletin board, such as other places around that have direct links to live feeds, to press releases, and the like. In that way, a subject which we all know changes practically weekly, those changes are on the frontier, and that frontier is being pumped right in. And so our hope is that we have built a facility that has a shelf life that goes far beyond what you would think the shelf life would be, given the rate at which news stories hit the media. A couple of things for you, Jim, in terms of building this, in terms yes. of conceiving this. Did you have to, you had a reputation already for building cultural institutions, for building institutions and museums and things like that. You're, in fact, uh, the chosen architect for the Clinton Library in Little Rock. Do you have to go get informed for something like this? I mean, this is, seems to me, where do you go to school to do this? <laughs> The school of hard knocks. No, yeah. I, I, you, th there because is an element of intuition. Architecture, architecture in some ways is the art of preconception, something that I don't like to say publicly too much, but in fact it is. Uh, you do make leaps, leaps of faith, but in this case, they're leaps of faith built, first of all, on a museum that's been around since 1871. A science which, as Neil points out, has exponentially grown in information distributed since 1980. You have some wonderful. Um, the half of all knowledge uh, that we've got on the universe has acquired, been acquired since, since 1985. All, half of all the knowledge of we have about the universe? Half of all published work on the universe has occurred since 1985 that has ever is been published. Is that true about most fields? Or is I, I bet it is. True about yeah, I, I bet it is. I, I, I remember once, speak for the once hearing it, what, it, what, is, right. it is, in a funny not way, right. not true about my field. Okay. Oh. Architecture is, architecture is, no pun intended, it is grounded. It takes as much time, for various reasons, to build a public building today as it did 300 years ago. Now, it has to do with government regulation. There was no landmark preservation 300 years ago. Yeah. But, that, but that's very... It's much. true about scholarship, though, Jim. I remember oh, it is about scholarship. That, that, that yeah. half the uh, books written about Frank Lloyd Wright have been written in the last 10 years. Oh, yeah. Not, okay. so, well, I, I'm like leaving that. out yes. the okay. scholarship part, but actually the building. And I, I, in answering some question not so long ago, somebody said, well, you know, what do you think about that? And I, I coined this, this phrase. I said, I call it it has evolved to become this kind of iconic uh, science machine, has become a cosmic cathedral. And what Paul said something that kind of reminded me that, that there is a certain truth to that. In the 15th and 16th, 14th century, people, the cathedral was the kind of the spatial symbol that people came to then, of course, for religion. But it had to do with spatial memory, which takes me back to what I said before. This people will come to, not for religion, but maybe some would say the new religion, they're going to come here to be educated in the wonders of the universe. So in that sense, the cathedral analogy yeah, is... Go ahead. But the science is very compelling, too. I mean, I know that I, oh. as a non-scientist, became so engaged in learning about it. I think I barely deserve to be described as somebody who knows anything about it. But in fact, to prepare the piece I did on it, I love delving into it. I think Jim did as well, and Ellen herself clearly yeah, had become very engaged. And one of the most moving things for me also was 
learning how engaged Fred Rose, the primary donor, had been with the science. And he was not a scientist, he was a builder. Visiting, and yet, visiting he got side so and excited. Know all the people yes. adored the science. Oh, yeah. He studied He started it. reading books he started on astrophysics. studying it very deeply. And it, it does that to you. It does grab you and it makes you want to know more about it, in effect, to sort of be worthy of what's going, of the mission going on. He called me up, he wouldn't say, this is Fred Rose, but he called me up and say, what's that I just read in the paper today about this quasar? And it was, it was right off the top, and he had this insatiable thirst to learn more about what was going on here. He and never wanted us to compromise the presentation of the science for anything, which of course was right in tune with our mm -hmm. values anyway. The other thing that's been commented on is the, the role of the icon. But here the icon is also an element of the exhibit. It's an element of exhibitry mm -hmm. per both Jim and Neil's uh, goals. And I think you yeah. should really talk about that for well, a second. Well, I think it's, had Jim come back to us with a pyramid, or an obelisk, <laughs> it would have not happened. It, 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 it could only done. have it's been, been a, done, Neil. It could, only, <laughs> <laughs> it could only have been a sphere because no other shape so so thoroughly represents the, the the contents of the universe. And with the sphere, we have an exhibit icon. We could work with the sphere. We can use it as an icon, a, a, as a scaling reference to compare the relative sizes of things in the universe, from the observable universe all the way on down through planets, through molecules, through atoms all the way down to the nucleus. We can, with, with a walkway, we can lay down the whole history of cosmic time and immerse you in that experience. We could have put a timeline, to Paul's point, we could have put a timeline on a wall and you just look at it, but that wouldn't immerse you, that wouldn't become a visceral experience. We want you to remember what you did for having visited this facility. And this was conceived for a technology which, although it's here now, it isn't really, you know, you can't take it off the shelf, and that is to actually project images, not upon, but from inside, and I had this dream that we could turn this into Jupiter. You could turn it into Mars. Neil could, could turn it into many planets as yet undiscovered. I want to ask you to choose now. What do you think is going to be the most popular thing here? <laughs> Space show. Space show. Tell me what that is. The space show is what happens inside the top half of the hemisphere, the top half of the Hayden Planetarium, and it's where we present a show that really takes you through space. And in the old Hayden Planetarium, as glorious as it was, and as much as many of us remember it with loving memories from our youth, uh, we could only take you to the night sky. And as Neil was saying a moment ago, uh, what we know today takes our learning well beyond the night sky, and now we will take the public past the night sky, through the Milky Way, out into the Virgo supercluster, and on into intergalactic space and show them the universe as they've never seen or felt it or imagined it before, it will be utterly dazzling, as will the whole visit. What do you think is going to be the favorite place here? Well, as, a, as Ellen said, one hates to pick amongst their children. I, 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 my shot is, is the Heilbrunn Cosmic Pathway. This is where we began our right. trip. The ramp that spins out of the Big Bang and lands at this prow above us, giving one a choice of going in to the Gottesman Hall of the planet Earth or on down to the Cullman Hall of the universe. And the reason I say that is this. There is another building in New York City that bears a superficial resemblance to this and may be the last powerful architectural uh, built image in the city. That's the Guggenheim. What I remember my wife and I taking our Peter, our Jenny, they didn't know about art. They didn't know about Ellsworth Kelly. They wanted to go up and then come down fast. It was about mo mobility, movement, the idea of infinity. Uh, people are going to enjoy that. And in this case, it actually allows you to see the entire Rose Center from hundreds of different perspectives while at the same time absorbing the idea of time marching on and on, forward and on and on, backward. I think it's going to be uh, now, Let me just out. get to one point about the cosmic pathways. We walked down. Did they present to you, we want to accomplish this objective? I mean, we have the idea of, of a cosmic walkway that will show the billions and billions of years of time and at the same time show how small it is, or did that 
become your creation and your idea? N no, there. I, I, there I'm was, trying to understand the merger here. There was very little. Of, there was no first person in that. It, it's all seamless. I mean, it's what we almost consider. If I remember the meetings right, you could have all of us sitting around, and we at some point we had to get out of the bottom of the sphere. You got to get out of the sphere. You got to get it's out of the sphere. In the middle of yeah. space, we have a practical so, problem in yeah, the first yeah, instance. Yeah. We're coming out of the Big yeah. Bang, and you want to therefore tell a linear story. And and Neil and his colleagues already know that the big ideas that they have to get across are time and scale. Those are the hard ones. And so he's got, and we got to get downstairs here. So we're coming it comes together that's, that that that's it. So when you come out of the planetarium, out of out of, out of the, the beginning the big bang. of time, out of the beginning the big of time, bang, out of the big yeah. bang. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Now so, this is it's so Jim more sees a pathway and Neil seizes on that. Yeah, but, didn't, but didn't almost simultaneously. No, yeah, but sure. remember we had many many discussions, occasionally heated not only with Neil, I but with others. No, you would. Yeah. Yeah. No, but about circu sounds dumb. Circulation. This is not just a helical hallway, but in fact, how do you? There is a there is a story here, and how do you get from place to place and have people feel comfortable, unthreatened, ready to ingest information? And this did the trick. Is this a home run, Paul? Or is I think it, it is. I think it is. Uh, I think people will will love every part of it. They will remember probably the Sky Show most vividly because it's so powerful and remarkable as Ellen, Ellen said. Uh, and it really is the new version of the classic old planetarium show but changed a hundredfold. But I think they'll want to do something else too which is that they'll stand out on 81st Street and just stare at it. I think the, the power of this whole thing as a pure abstract piece of architecture will be a magnet that will pull people in and will be a very vivid and powerful image even for those people who don't go in. But I think it will pull them in, and most of them will. For those of us who live in New York City, to drive along looking, which is the North View, along 81st Street, you know, for months and 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 months, we've been wondering, what is going on there? <laughs> you know, and, and amazing, anybody who drives along 81st Street now, or walks along 81st Street, or lives across from, on 81st Street, has been looking, saying, you know, it's almost as you say. It's like a. Planet. I've watched their trajectory as they landed. walk down the street and they start. The planet has landed a magnetically, the you know, leaning well, towards the right well, center I, I, I of actually, Central Park. I live in the neighborhood and I've been walking my dog past it for the last three years. So I've actually literally watched it day by day by day. It's very rare in New York that an ambitious work of architecture, actually rare that it happens at all, unfortunately, but even rarer that it happens almost without compromise. And this is one of the few times where. Yeah an ambitious work of architecture has actually been brought to fruition without any significant degree of compromise. Put it in some context for me in terms of how, uh, you know, I mean obviously it's the best and most interesting piece of architecture to be built in this city for a well, long certainly time. Certainly for several years. Yes. More than several yes. years. I mean tell me what it compares to that in terms of... Major public pieces of yes. architecture in New York? Yes. Good question. Let's see. What's the last? Um, but it's not just true of New yeah. York. I mean, mm -hmm. it's true of most places. I mean, you're, are we talking here about something on the scale of Bilbao, on the scale of of the Louvre, in terms of what I M P did, on the scale of a very important architectural creations of public institutions? I think we are. I don't know that it will shake people's sense of the meaning and potential of architecture in quite the same way Bill Bow did. But it will be as powerful a magnet, and ultimately it will mean as much in terms of public appreciation of architecture, I think, as it will mean in terms of public appreciation of science. That's my point. Yeah. I think because, it will. I think it will do both of those things. What? Because what? Because there's Because of the power of the space, because of the power of the object, because of how accessible it is, more than most profound buildings are accessible. I want to add, add something to that. I think it represents, or will come to represent, a new confidence that institutions like the American Museum of Natural History, and this means other universities and museums and great libraries, can in fact have the courage to move ahead with grand plans. This country has become somewhat regressive in the building of public buildings mm -hmm. over, well, over the last 25, 30, at a very time when our income is doing right. this, um, there are the kind of public attitudes about nostalgia, you know, have moved maybe a little closer to Las Vegas than they have to 
West 81st I, Street. I think the point is building boldly and fulfilling a certain functional mission are not mutually exclusive. That in fact, right. building boldly can actually support the functional and practical goals, not go against them. You have to assemble the talent at the same time, really at the same place, mm -hmm. and have that talent harmonize, as Jim said earlier, right. enter resonance orbits with each other. You need just the right amount of ego, but just the right amount of humble elements so that ideas can flow into the pot and be stirred and then come back out having elevated, having elevated to something grand and something that fulfills all the needs of all the parties. And you can't just summon that up. Well, what Neil's getting at, this is the most interdisciplinary project that most of us has ever yeah, worked I on. I, I mean, you've got this A team of talent in Neil, in Jim, in Ralph Applebaum. It's an extraordinary and, and, gathering. But, 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 Paul will make but, Alan Fudd is leaving out one thing, in my view. The single most important ingredient that made this possible, and that is very rare today in an age of management committees, is institutional leadership. Well, you had a great board and a what great donor. did it. Yeah, I, well, That's you can right. be modest if you want to. I well, I, you know, well, it's, but, it's but more but than I mean, one person. No, he's, but, he's, uh, well, but you're right. You have to have somebody with the guts. Paul knows this better than well, I do. Somebody with the guts and who's willing to right. say, we go. We can get the money and we go. And then you've got to have someone no great like Fred Rose right. who's willing to say, I'll, I'll give you the seed money right, right. right now tomorrow, get started. So it's worth saying, and not just for the sake of modesty, that not only did Fred do that, no, but Jim yeah. and Neil will remember the great day when Dick Gilder challenged us all and said, right. have you thought boldly enough? And so we were, we had courage, but we were getting fabulous trustee support, and yeah. that's also that's from That's a good point, Ellen. We spent eight months or so trying to shoehorn in this much material into the corridors that existed in the previous Hayden, and, the, and trust... And I don't have the right to say, let's think from a blank slate, but uh, uh, Dick Gilder said, can you think bigger than this? What, suppose you had no constraints, what would come out of this collaboration? When was the last time you heard that? No, no. <laughs> I didn't say that was, a, that was the first time I ever heard it. I remember it was a, a, a kind of darkened room. I didn't know where this voice came from. <laughs> and I knew the answer. He also said, Good. that doesn't mean we'll do it. <laughs> no, that's true. He did say that, didn't he? All right. It is leadership, and it is energy, and it's vision, and it's... Uh, what I'm struck by in the end, it's the combination of science uh, and curiosity and dreams and vision uh, uh, that make this place a unique experience. Um, you should come to New York and enjoy this Rose Center for Earth and Space uh, at the New York Museum of Natural History. Uh, you will walk away with an experience that will um, linger in your mind and make you want to come back. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.